Before I get into my review, I wanted to tell you guys about one of my favorite websites, Skillshare. Skillshare is an amazing online platform by creatives for creatives that's all about teaching each other new creative skills. From writing to illustration to animation, there are literally so many things you can learn on Skillshare right now. My favorite class that I've ever taken on Skillshare is a productivity class by Thomas Frank. It helped me be more productive and I am so thankful for the lessons that I learned. Right now, the first 1,000 of you guys who click on the link in the description box below will get a free month of Skillshare Premium, and I think you should definitely check it out. Anyway, on to the review. Hey guys, it is Kat, and I'm here at 3.30 in the morning, ready to film a new movie review for you. Look at what I do for you guys. I work so hard and push myself so much to watch these movies for you. So this movie came highly requested. It is the movie Secretary, and this is a film that I've technically seen, but I do not remember anything about. A lot of you guys know that I went to film school, and I don't remember anything about watching this movie in college. Um, I remember that there's a scene where Maggie Gyllenhaal's like bent over on top of a desk. I don't remember the exact context of that, um, but that's all I remember. And I'm, I'm hopeful for this. I think this is probably going to be one of the better movies that I've watched, um, but I also don't know. So you guys know that one of the big reasons why I'm doing this series is because I wanted to sort of see if there are good representations of BDSM in film because everything we've seen so far is trash and a half. Christian Grey leans in and says in his most Dommy McDomerson voice, I don't make love. I fuck hard. <laughs> But, you know, who knows? Maybe this is going to be the quintessential representation. Um, now, one of the things I will say about this is that we've been talking about these movies as a form of escapism. And so I'm going to keep that in mind when I watch these. Um, I know that this is a movie about a woman having sex with her boss. So there's a lot to be said about that, but um, I'm, I'm not going to ignore that there are plenty of people who have a fantasy for that sort of thing. And as long as it's just a fantasy, I have less of an issue with it. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go into this movie with an open mind. I'm going to go into it expecting very little, but um, I'm going to, I have to be honest, you guys really made this movie sound like this was like, the cream of the crop. So anyway, I'm going to be painting my nails throughout this whole movie. Um, last time I did a movie review, I painted my nails. This is literally the same nail polish from the last review. Um, as you see, we are due for um, a refresh. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, I, honestly, watching movies is the only way I can manage to get my nails done somewhat decently. So um, yeah. Anyway, um, like I've been trying to do, I'm really going to try to watch this movie and criticize what it is trying to sell me, if it is trying to sell me anything, but that's really what I'm going to limit my criticism to, that and whether or not it's a good movie and whether or not the plot is good. So yeah, we're going to watch this movie. I'm pretty excited. Um, I'm going to be trying to narrate the plot as we go through it, and then I'll come back to you guys with my final review. So let's jump right in. So the film starts with Maggie Gyllenhaal doing a bunch of tasks while having um, some spreader bars on her hands. And I thought this was a really cool scene because I think this is so far, even though this is the first movie, pretty realistic. Like a lot of times when you're in a BDSM relationship um, like this, you'll have tasks that you have to perform. And she does a series of tasks while in a certain position. But this is where she is now. We flash back to six months before where she's just getting out of a mental institution and is on her way to a wedding. At her sister's wedding, which doubles as her welcoming back party, she runs into her alcoholic father, and this stresses her out so much that she runs to her room. In her bedroom, she goes under her bed and finds this box with all of these sharp implements in them. She sits them all out in a very sort of ceremonious fashion, and she begins the process of wanting to cut herself. It's really clear that she's done this many, 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 many times before. 
to the point where she actually has a sanding stone in her bedroom. But later that night, she hears her father fighting with her mother, and this actually sets her over the edge. She's in the kitchen at the time, and she's boiling water, and she takes the kettle into her bedroom and burns her inner thigh. And this finally gives her some sense of relief. Lee is going to secretary school at a community college, and she is trying her best to get out of the home. Apparently, she's been self-harming since the seventh grade, and the reason why she ended up in the insane asylum is because she tried to cut herself once and she ended up cutting far too deep. When she comes home from school, her mother is trying to hide all of the sharp objects and she goes upstairs to grab her box of sharp objects to throw away. As she throws them away, she reconsiders picking them back up again and as she does, she sees a ad in the paper for a secretary. So she goes to interview for her new position, which is apparently with a lawyer who is quite a bit to handle. She walks right in and she sees the woman who is presumably the previous person who used to be his secretary and she's in tears. The, uh, the whole office is in just total disarray and the guy is very, very strange. He tries to basically convince her out of applying for the job by saying that it's very, very mundane work and she says that that's exactly what she wants. After looking at her really, really hard, he gives her the job. So Lee starts working with him and she's a pretty quick study. She really does take to being a secretary pretty quickly, even though she doesn't know what a paralegal is or what a paralegal does. Um, she has a really good attitude and she is willing to basically do almost anything that he asks for. In fact, she kind of figures out what he needs before he even says he needs it. When she comes in for work, she gives him a bag of donuts. He doesn't really seem to acknowledge them. After digging through the trash to find some files that he discarded, she comes back with the files in hand and apparently he's already found an extra pair. When she walks over to the trash can, she notices that he's thrown away the donuts that she purchased for him. Okay, so I've done like the first layer of color. As you see, basic bitch nudes everywhere. <laughs> oh, by the way, her new boss's name is Edward Gray the original Christian Grey. From the very first time we meet him, Edward Gray has been longingly staring at this photo. Well, the woman in the photo shows up to his office and demands an audience with Edward Gray. Mr. Gray tells Lee to tell her that he's not there, and she does. Simultaneously, she gets a phone call randomly from her father at the office, and this upsets her so much, and the frustration between that conversation leads her to considering self-harm once again, but she ultimately doesn't do it. It's clear that her father is a trigger for her. The next day, she goes on a date with this guy named Peter, who she's known since high school. And I think this date is at a laundromat or something. And Christian and Edward Gray, rather, he just happens to be doing his laundry at the same time and sees her on this date. And he is clearly a little jealous. The next day at work, he's trying to find every single reason to punish her, make her redo work, and is criticizing her appearance, saying that the way that she dresses is disgusting and that she is a visual representation of his business. So at some point, he asks her in a very awkward way, what is exactly going on with the self-cutting because he did earlier in the movie notice that she had some cuts going up her leg. In very firm words, Mr. Gray says that she is no longer going to be cutting herself and he lets her go home early and says that she should take a long walk home. I'm drying. <laughs> the next day she comes to work and she's made yet another typing mistake, and he decides that the best way to address this mistake is to have her come into the other room where he, without her consent, decides to spank her while she bends over the table and reads her typing mistakes. Oh my god. I'm calling HR. Dear Mr. Garvey, I'm grateful to you for referring. Wow. Yeah, that's, I don't like that. I am not a fan of that. No consent, just did it. Just absolutely did it. Just didn't ask. Just assumed that that was okay. Mm -hmm. Noticed that she was vulnerable, decided to take advantage of it. Yeah, sorry, I've got issues already with this. <laughs> 
After she gets spanked, she goes into the bedroom and sees that she has a big bruise. She goes back and types the letter and she makes no mistakes. She goes home, grabs her cutting stuff and tosses it into the river the next day. And this scene is the essential shift in their relationship. They start having this relationship where he's giving her certain tasks to do. She is making mistakes on purpose so that she can get punished. And they just start having this rapport where BDSM has become part of their relationship. It's clear that she has essentially found something new to replace her cutting habit. One day she intentionally makes a mistake and she expects to get a spanking for it, but he doesn't do it. She threatens to leave and he doesn't really seem phased by the threat and she leaves and goes home. When she's at home, she's sitting by the pool with her friends and her mother and her mom gets a phone call from the hospital. Her father has apparently been checked into the hospital. This sends her into a place of depression where she's now trying to figure out exactly how to cope. So she goes to Mr. Gray and tries to figure out a way to basically say that she wants him to spank her but he doesn't really pick up on it and it's clear that he doesn't want to be in that sort of relationship where she is being um, reliant on him for that sort of stuff. He goes completely cold on her and this becomes a really big source of frustration for Lee who no longer has that coping mechanism to the point where she goes into the bathroom and tries to spank herself out of frustration, but it's just not the same. One day while Lee's in the garden, she finds a worm and she decides that she's going to try to get Christian Edward Gray's attention. <laughs> Oh my God, I keep getting that mixed up. She's going to try to get Edward Gray's attention by putting the worm in a piece of mail. We go to a scene where Lee is having sex with her boyfriend, Peter, and it's really clear that Peter is a vanilla and Peter just isn't into the stuff that Edward Gray is. She tries to get him to spank her, but he just doesn't pick up on it at all. And it's clear that she's not really happy in her vanilla sex life. The next day, Edward Gray finds the worm in the letter and he lays it on a piece of paper and puts a big red circle around it the way that he would every typo that she's ever made. So she thinks that she's finally getting what she wants. She thinks that she's finally getting the spanking that she's been desiring over the past couple of weeks, right? So she comes into the room, she bends over in front of the worm and awaits her spanking. Mr. Gray asks her to show her bare bottom and makes it clear that he's not going to have sex with her. While they're having this conversation, her boyfriend Peter randomly decides to show up at the office looking for her and Lee yells out to him that she's not going to be able to make it to the diner today. After her boyfriend leaves, Mr. Gray masturbates over her bottom, has an orgasm, and then tells her to get back to her duties. Lee is clearly disappointed. So like basically what's happening is this guy is just looking for a person to sexually control and then compartmentalize entirely. You know, this is very common, I think. This is not an uncommon thing. And much like previous um, things that we reviewed on this channel, I'm not going to say that it's unrealistic because there are definitely men like this. Um, I think that the, the point about him not wanting to actually have sex with her is something that's very realistic. I mean, I, I wish more people understood that quite a few people in BDSM do BDSM with people that they don't actually want to have sex with. It's not always like this. It's often not, you know, but you know, this is a situation where she clearly wants something more and he isn't interested in that. And he is getting off on the power and the control. And that's, you know, normal for a dominant type or whatever, but you know, she basically you know, said no to seeing her boyfriend so that her boss could jerk off over her butt. And that has to make her feel very, very foolish because that's not the sort of dynamic that um, she signed up for, I don't think. So after she doesn't get her spanking, she goes to the bathroom and she pulls out this thing that apparently Mr. Gray put there, which is like this wadded up collection of mistakes. And she puts it on the wall in the bathroom and she's so turned on that she starts masturbating in the bathroom. Ah, I can't. Oh my God. She's oh, this is so cringe. I can't handle this. 
The only problem is that there's somebody in the next stall listening. It's another paralegal, and she is clearly quite disturbed by what she's hearing as she says these very strange things out loud. Meanwhile, Mr. Gray has a uh, suspicious stain, I'll just say, on his jacket that he is frantically trying to get out. He then decides to destroy a lot of the evidence that he has of um, some of the inappropriate stuff that he's been doing. He apparently keeps this folio of Polaroids of the previous women that he's done this with that have probably worked with him. And you do see on, on that picture that the woman who left the office in the very beginning when Lee was first walking in is in that folio. So this is clearly something that he does with everyone. The next day, Mr. Gray wants to fire Lee. He starts typing up an apology message, basically saying that he doesn't know why he does this. Um, he is clearly somebody who is really struggling to um, understand or accept himself as a kinky person. He ultimately decides not to give her the letter, but does decide to call her in, give her another interview, and ultimately fires her. Obviously, this pisses Lee off quite a bit. So after he fires her, she's kind of left out in the cold. She doesn't really know what to do with her life. She ends up going on a slew of blind dates from classified ads for people who are looking for kinksters. And she doesn't really find anybody that she connects with. She just ends up finding a bunch of weirdos. And then randomly out of nowhere, her boyfriend proposes to her. On the day of their wedding, Lee looks at herself in the mirror and realizes that she just can't do this. And so she runs to Mr. Gray's office to confess her love to him. So Mr. Gray feels like the conversation has already be been had. You know, he's not going to love her in the way that she loves him. But he decides to give her a test. He tells her to go sit on his desk and put her palms flat and sit there until he comes back and tells her she can move. And so she sits there for days and days and days on end. Eventually he comes back. He picks her up, takes her home, cleans her up and proclaims his love to her. And then they become a normal everyday couple and she becomes submissive in the context of being his wife. And that's the end. That is how this movie ends. All right, so now it's time for my critiques and boy, do I have some. So I want to start out by saying that I actually think that this film of the films that we've seen so far, is definitely the most realistic when it comes to BDSM. There's a lot of stuff in this movie that I definitely feel reflects the BDSMers that I know, some aspects of the way that BDSM appeals to me. Um, like one thing that they talked about um, was when he spoke about her self-harm, um, he spoke about her enjoying seeing herself get hurt and then heal and and that's something that makes her feel alive i'm not exactly that way i sort of enjoy physically pushing myself um to a certain point that i didn't think i could go and surviving it i kind of really enjoy that aspect of it for me personally um i've never self-harmed in that way i've definitely self-harmed in other ways i do think that those those aspects of it are, are very true and realistic. It is true that there are a handful of people who have self-harmed and then found BDSM to be a, a sort of haven for them. That is very, very, very true. Um, but there are some larger problems that I have with this film. I mean, the most immediate thing that I'm struck with is the fact that he spanked her without consent. Like that for me is the biggest part. Now, like I said, I understand that some of these movies are fantasy, are escapism, are not supposed to be taken literally. I get and respect and acknowledge and see that. I totally, totally do. But I almost feel like there was a way they could have done this in a way that didn't violate consent, but the not violating consent part, I think in the mythology of this movie would have made it boring and not sexy. It's sexy that he doesn't ask her permission. It's sexy that he is in a position of power over her and then, you know, puts her in these strange positions. Like, ugh. You know, I, I don't I don't love that. Um, it's it's pretty accurate that 
there are people who will do stuff in BDSM and then carry a ton of shame around it. That's very, very, very true. What I don't think that they really established is that shame, you know? We see him become incredibly ashamed of his BDSM the moment he has an orgasm over her naked butt after telling her that he has no interest in having sex with her. Um, that's the most that we see. And then he tells her to sit there for a couple of days and then he comes back and they fall in love. And that's supposed to be like romantic. That's supposed to be like adorable, but it's not, it's absolutely not. You know, it's absolutely not. Uh, um, I, when I, and, and, and I, I take issue with that for a lot of reasons, but the, but the biggest one being that he really didn't present anything from my perspective that would have suggested to her that he loved her. You know, and there's nothing in his actions that would have made me reach that conclusion either. It really did seem like he wasn't particularly interested in her beyond the context of office fun time. Um, and I guess I'm just confused. I guess I'm just really baffled by um, how that all turned out because I full on expected him to be like, hey, you wait here for me and I'll come back and get you someday. And I full on expected her to be there until like the day she died. Like I, I felt that, that, that that's how it would end because that's what I think would make sense. Um, he is ashamed, he's running away. And I could understand him maybe coming back and saying, you know, I release you, please. I don't want this anymore. But I don't entirely understand coming back and falling in love and getting married so quickly. You know, it just, that to me doesn't seem realistic. Now him being very hot and cold to me, it's very realistic. I've known a lot of dominants like that who are super, super heavy early on. And then they, because of shame or for other things, they play it down. They, um, don't do it anymore. And that could really leave um, you know, a, a submissive in a very confusing state when you're super present in one moment and not present at all in another. Um, we didn't see any aftercare in this entire movie with the exception of the, so the shower scene at the very, very end. Um, again, I mean, I get why people like this movie as a BDSM reference, but like, I don't know about that. I don't know about all that. I really don't. Cause to me, this movie is just so unrealistic in so many other ways. It gets some stuff, right? It does, but it's just, I, I don't, I, I don't love some of the messages in this. Oh, here's the thing. So let's just bring this super, super relevant to BDSM, right? Um, now I want to say that Lee was probably more of a brat. Um, a brat is the kind of person who will ultimately bottom, but, um, likes to sort of attempt to sort of push the buttons of the dominant. And he seems to enjoy that. And that's a good time da 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 da, whatever, whatever. But I think oftentimes what we don't talk about in the BDSM community is that dominants have boundaries too. Right. Um, we talk a lot about submissives being able to draw up these boundaries and to define these things and to say yes and to say no. Um, and, and all of that is great and valuable. And I think that those are conversations we should be having, obviously. But I think that we often ignore the fact that dominance can absolutely have their space and their consent and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, violated. And I felt like what she was doing so frequently was pushing his buttons in a way where, um, he would potentially not feel, um, like it's his, it's, it's a mutual dynamic anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, I don't know I, if a dominant tells me no, I'm probably not going to chase after him. Now, maybe that's my fault. Maybe I should be chasing after these dominants. But, you know, when he says no, I think walking away is probably the best idea. 
I think that's one of the things that feels very unrealistic to me too, is like if a dominant says no, if you just keep pushing the buttons more and more and more and sort of yelling, I love you at this guy that he's going to change his tune. That's just like literally not how it works. You know, like a dominant usually isn't going to, because you've pressured him, decide to change the nature of the relationship. That's usually not how it's going to happen. Now, I'm sure there are some submissives out there who have pressured, you know, men into changing the nature of the relationship. I don't doubt that, but like, I don't know. That just seems very unrealistic to me. I'm very curious how some of the BDSMers in the audience feel about that as well. I feel like they were really trying to construct a nice guy narrative with Peter because Peter's biggest sin is being vanilla and not being Mr. Gray. That's like all that's wrong with him, really. Um, and I don't know, like if I had to choose between Peter and Mr. Gray, I would definitely choose Peter. Peter can learn to enjoy spanking my butt. Um, Mr. Gray has a lot of issues that he needs to unpack. And I guess I'm kind of depressed that, that they didn't really address that. I think it's like a lot of things we watch where like, I feel like they could have added a little bit more of something establishing the, the conflict and it would change everything so much, you know? Um, the fact that we don't really understand why he feels shame for doing this. Cause to me, it doesn't even seem like he feels shame doing it because he's doing it to his employees. He just doesn't, he, he just in general feels uncomfortable with it. Um, and I guess that sucks, but you're also doing this to your employees, which should distress you quite a bit more. I really didn't understand why the BDSM started, where it came from, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that the one thing I will say about this movie that I did enjoy was that I definitely, unlike um, Fifty Shades of Grey, we definitely have an understanding of why Lee is into BDSM. We don't really know why um, Mr. Grey is. Um, we make a lot of assumptions, but we don't like really know, but I appreciated that because so frequently, um, you know, there really isn't a, a reason why suddenly this person who, um, is vanilla would be interested in BDSM. I, I that's usually not the, the case. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm a little disappointed by the movie. I'll be honest. Like I, I really was expecting it to be a bit of a different film, but I definitely think that it is of the movies we've watched the most realistic portrayal of BDSM. Um, I think it is um, the best film that we've seen so far, for sure. It is a really well-made film um, and it's got its moments. It's got its moments, but yeah, I, I did not walk away from this film feeling like, wow, I feel seen in the way that I think a lot of other people did. So that is my review. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what other movies you guys would like for me to watch and review. I appreciate it. Also, yes, I did manage to finish my nails. They came out really nice, I think. They're all kind of, you know, shiny and nude colored, which is just as subtle as, as I want them to be. So yeah, um, thank you for um, hanging out with me and um, letting me paint my nails and have a conversation with you guys about movies. And I guess I'll see you guys next time. All right, bye.